Verdun, the scene of one of the longest and most costly battles of the war. It started in February 1916 and lasted 11 months. Each month there were 70,000 French and German casualties. Verdun typified what the war had become, a war of attrition. In order to break this stalemate along the Western Front, an offensive was planned in the Somme area of France. The Germans had to be distracted from Verdun, so a somewhat reluctant British general, Sir Douglas Haig, and the French general, Joseph Joffre, conceived a plan for an attack, a big push around the River Somme and its tributary, the Ancre, in July 1916. This offensive came to be known as the Battle of the Somme, which was the first main action for many of the new volunteer armies of Field Marshal Kitchener. The 36th Ulster Division was to be part of this big push. They had completed their initial training in Ulster and followed that up at Seaford in England. By late 1915 they had sailed for France, where they were prepared for the forthcoming offensive. By June 1916, the Ulster men were positioned near the River Ancre and close to Thiepville village. At the end of June they were in Thiepville Wood, ready to engage the Germans. Little did they realise what horror lay ahead of them, as on the 1st of July they came out of the wood into history. Thiepville Wood lies a hundred metres or so from the Ulster Tower. It is out of bounds to the public for, contained within the few acres of forest that remain are shells and lethal gas canisters from World War I. They lie buried in the soil and are a real danger. For many years the Somme Association has teamed up with professional archaeologists to excavate the wood. Much of this work has concentrated on opening up the trench and avenue system that crisscrosses the wood. Teddy Culligan, a guide, explains. This uh, area here, this is Speyside? A Speyside. Tell us something about Speyside. Speyside, uh, another Scottish name. All the trenches in the wood except for Inniskillen Street and Belfast Castle. That's the only two. Well, there's another one, there's another one. Uh, sap number two is called Thinner Sap. There's nine saps running out of the wood and number two is Thinner Sap. Uh, number one doesn't have a name, I can't find a name, but I have the names for all the others right all the way down the valley. There's eight saps have names and number one doesn't have, doesn't have a name. The Scottish soldiers came into Thiepville Wood on the 31st of July 1915. They came in and they met the, the, uh, they met the French at a little place in the wood called the Etoile, which is the star, and the star still exists to this day. It's where six roads come together. I call it six road ends. So, I do. so the six roads still come together and there's nothing has changed in the wood. The little roads in the wood are exactly the same as they are on the maps. The trenches are still visible. You can still see the trenches in the wood. It was at the back of the wood at a place called Magenta that there was a group of huts. These huts were used as kitchens and it was from here that the soldiers left on the eve of battle with their rations in order to make their way to the front line, which was several hundred metres away. Well, here we are, Teddy, at the back of uh, Thiepville Wood. Uh, can you give us some indication of what we're looking at now? Right, where we are now is uh, an area of commercial planting, which was commercial planting uh, prior to the war as well. It's still an area of commercial planting. This is where the kitchens were. This area is called Magenta. And if you look at my photograph, the little track here that runs along here is this track that's running through the photograph. These are kitchens actually dug into the ground. The walls don't look very, very high, but there were steps down into them. So what they'd actually done was they'd dug, they'd dug holes, they'd dug big, big uh, holes in the ground, and they had put the buildings over the top of them to give the soldiers a certain amount of protection. This is where they would have got their last meal coming up and this is also where they would probably have picked up their supplies for what they were going to need for the next four days. Everyone carried four days supply on the 1st of July. They were expected to keep going for four days, unfortunately they didn't. But we're at the top end of 
Black Horse Road and Black Horse Road is the uh, route that the Ulster Division took. The recent work of the archaeologists has meant that a few of the trenches right on the front line have been excavated and these have been made safe for the general public. Access to the trenches is by prior arrangement with Somme Association staff who are located at the nearby Ulster Tower. If circumstances permit, then a member of staff provides a guided tour of the trench system. Artifacts found to date by the archaeologists have included gas canisters, shells and also personal effects. Many of these are already on display at the Interpretation Centre at the Ulster Tower, as well as at the Somme Museum in Northern Ireland. These artifacts belong to the men from Ulster who, on the eve of the Battle of the Somme, move from the back of the wood to the frontline trenches, many of them never to return to their homeland. Well, from we were at the back of the wood to here, you would, you would do that whole distance in a trench. You were never up where we're standing. You would never come up to here. So your whole life, when you're in the, the, the battle area and the frontline area, would be spent in a trench. You wouldn't be looking out over the countryside or anything like that. You would come up here after you got your, your food and supplies down at the bottom. You would come up here and this is where you would spend four days. Four days, possibly four nights, possibly three nights. And once the communication trenches are cleared and everybody's up here, what have you got? You've got twice as many men up here. Now the enemy knew that. So look at any regimental diary and have a look at the last column, the last paragraph in any regimental diary and the list of men they lost during the changeover, during the relief. And that's simply because the enemy knew when we were changing and you've got twice as many targets here as you have during the other four days. So you're going to, you're going to be shelled during the changeover. Close to the Ulster Tower are the remains of a German observation post. Not much of it remains now, but the Germans had a number of such posts right along the line. A line that was heavily defended, particularly the Schwaben and Stuff Redoubts, which were German strongholds. The Germans had a great respect for the British soldier, as German military historian Professor Kruger Norbert explains. They uh, described that this attack was a strong attack and that uh, soldiers from the British side were brave soldiers who did what was necessary and that the Germans did what was necessary. That means uh, they had respect for the courage of the attacking and they were glad to have survived in putting back the attacking uh, battalions. Professor Norbert's research about the German trench system and the battle strategy gives a most interesting insight into the battle from a German perspective. The German soldier was occupied by the officers uh, who said you must be trained in this or that. They were digging always the trenches because rain and winter time destroyed a lot. They were digging the dugouts. They started here with dugouts of 1 meter 50 and then 2 meter, 3 meters, 4 meters. That means a lot of work. And during the attack in July, the dugouts were 4 meters to 6 meters deep. Uh, sometimes it was enough, not always. And uh, very often during the night, a group of soldiers had to go into the no man's land. And these were exciting moments uh, because nobody wrote it in clear words. Uh, you had fear what could happen. And then when you were back, an officer was asking, what have you seen, what have you heard, have you taken a prisoner? This was a normal life, in the daily life. I think they were tired, they were exhausted and glad to have survived.
At 7.30 on the morning of Saturday, the 1st of July, 1916, the men of Ulster left their trenches in Thiefel Wood to attack the German lines. For them, it was the beginning of the Battle of the Somme. It was a beautiful summer's day, and hopes were high that the previous seven-day bombardment had created havoc among the German trenches. The 36th Ulster Division was commanded by Major General Nugent and it was made up of 107, 108 and 109 brigades. In effect, 12 battalions consisting of the Royal Irish Rifles, the Royal Inniskillen Fusiliers and the Royal Irish Fusiliers set off into no man's land. North of the River Ancre, disaster was almost immediate. Two battalions virtually wiped out by 8.30 a.m. South of the River Ancre, early progress was made, but as the day wore on, the situation became desperate. Divisions either side of the Ulstermen had been unable to take their respective objectives, Thiepville Village and Beaumont Hamel. This left the Ulster flanks exposed to terrible machine gun fire. The further the Ulstermen advanced, the more exposed they became and getting supplies and reinforcements through became well nigh impossible. Death was all around. And a poem believed to be written by a soldier who was serving with the 10th Battalion, the Royal Inniskillen Fusiliers, who were known as the Derries, expresses well the thoughts and experiences of the Ulster men. Come closer, Bill, old comrade. I'm glad to have you here. It does not seem too hard to die when one we love is near. For as kids we played together, shot marbles on the walls, and as used in the good old brandy well, we used to kick the ball. You'll tell them in the dear old town, old Derry on the foil, that the boys who drilled with wooden guns were worthy of their soil. But you'll hardly need to tell them, ere now the world has heard, what the hardy sons of Ulster for their king and country dared. With men falling right across the battlefield, it took a supreme effort by the Ulster men to take their objective. This was the Schwaben Redoubt, possibly the strongest German defensive position across the whole front. It was taken and held throughout the day. Terrible fighting continued through Sunday with many of the surviving soldiers trapped in no man's land. It may be someone blundered, the fault might have been our own. But when we reach trench number five, we find ourselves alone. Alone and unsupported amidst a withering fire. Yet we held our winnings gamely till the order came, retire. I cannot, nor will any man, the story ever tell. How caught in that triangle, it seemed the mouth of hell. With comrades falling, falling, we formed as on parade. You'll fight a rearguard action, was all our leaders said. And in that rearguard action, Bill, I got the knockout blow. The carnage was horrific. Men were cut to pieces as limb was torn from limb. It mattered not whether a soldier was Protestant or Roman Catholic, whether he was working class or landed gentry, what mattered was that these men were human beings experiencing what no man should ever experience. And now I've got to travel the road that all must go. When lying faint from loss of blood, I heard a brother's call. We cannot leave him here to die. Where one goes, we all. It was a chap from Monaghan a loyal man and true. He swung me across his shoulders and said, I'll see you through. Right matey, then another said, where one goes we all. I'll help you brother Ulster man, I'm County Donegal. Finally, on the night of Sunday the 2nd of July, the 36th Ulster Division was withdrawn. Ulster had lost 2,200 of its sons killed, with a further 3,333 who were listed as casualties or missing. Four 
Victoria Crosses had been won. The battle continued for another four and a half months, resulting in over one million from the Allied and German forces who were dead, missing or injured. The Ulsters fought the rearguard with many a hearty cheer. And the next thing I remember, I was being patched up here. But I know this effort's useless. I feel I'm going fast. I see the new day breaking for me will be the last. I'll ne'er again sit on the wall of an evening calm and cool to watch the youngsters playing tig around First Derry School. I thought of Derry's walls away when joining in the fight. I said it was for Ulster. I wanted right, left, right. So tell them in the dear old town, old Derry on the foil that the men who guarded Ireland's shore sleep neath a foreign soil. And when the news of victory comes and the cathedral joy bells ring, they'll raise a stone for those who fell, for country and for king. The British sustained somewhere between 55,000 and 60,000 casualties on the first day of the battle. The greatest loss in a single day that was ever suffered by the British Army. Little ground had been made, and so many lives had been lost and ruined in the battle. However, there was some success in relieving the pressure on the French at Verdun. The Ulster Tower, Thiepful Memorial, and the hundreds of cemeteries that litter the area are stones raised in the memory of those who paid the supreme sacrifice in the First World War. Buried in the ground around the river Ancre and Thiepville are the remains of hundreds of soldiers, as well as much battlefield debris. Fines are constantly being made, but none are treated with more respect and dignity than those which are human remains, such as those that were found recently during work that was designed to improve the road that runs between Thiepville Wood and the Ulster Tower. One has now been identified, the other unidentified. Apart from all this, both of these men, along with others, came out of the wood into history. <laughs>